Can everyone hear me all right? Great. So uh, thank you all for coming. So just before we start, did anyone see Yang's talk earlier about Elm? Fantastic. Cool. I will try not to disappoint you. Um, so hi, I'm Joe. This is my talk on Elm. Elm is a function reactive language. Um, we're basically going to cover the basics of it. So you may notice in the schedule that this is meant to be a live coding talk, and I have an apology about that. Um, that is that live coding is very hard when your backspace key doesn't work anymore. I was rehearsing this last night, and somehow I broke it. So I wrote these slides in the last hour while sitting upstairs. Um, every time I made a typo, I had to select the text and go to edit and cut to get rid of the text. Um, so to prevent me being like this, um, I thought we'd make some slides. Um, I'm not good enough to do live coding with no backspace. Um, so this is no longer an adventure in Elm. It's more a countryside ramble in Elm. Um, so we're going to go through the basics. Um, we're going to look at some examples online. Um, go through the tools, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, as I said, Yang does a very good live coding talk. It's on YouTube. If you want to see Elm live, I recommend looking up uh, Yang Ku's talk. He does some amazing stuff with it. Um, so yeah, Elm. This is the Elm logo. Uh, Elm is a bit of a buzzword rife language. Um, if you go for the buzzword uh, roundup of what Elm does, it's functional reactive. It has purely functional GUIs. Uh, it has a hot swapping editor. It has a time traveling debugger. Um, and all these things sound very impressive and very vague. Um, and we'll cover what they all mean. But just from a top overview, why should you care about these things? Why do you want a language that has all these amazing, bizarre sounding features? Um, and my reason for caring about that is I work at this company, PayPal. Um, and quite simply, we made a what I would consider interesting decision recently in we switched our entire, well, most of our stack, especially the front end stuff, to Node, which resulted in most of the company doing this. Um, but having seen JavaScript firsthand and having used JavaScript a lot, especially if you've ever seen uh, Bernhard's talk on JavaScript, the WAT talk, infamous WAT talk, uh, my reaction was more like this. Um, I despise JavaScript and everything about it. I think if anyone here, I imagine, well, when you come to functional programming, some are dynamic, some are strongly typed. I'm very much in the Haskell camp. So to me, JavaScript is like, oh my god, I don't know what it's doing. Um, and if you feel like that as well, we're not alone. Um, there's a vast horde of JS preprocessors now. Um, a lot, there's a big camp that wants to treat JavaScript as assembly language for the web. We can't avoid it. It's everywhere. But we don't have to write it. We can compile to it. So I mean, the most successful one right now is ClojureScript, because Clojure had a very good community that all managed to rally behind one solution. Um, there's also Microsoft's TypeScript and Facebook's Flow. Uh, Flow is actually just a type checker, not a preprocessor, but still. Um, so big companies are getting on this approach as well. But then, as I said, I'm a Haskeller, and unfortunately, our ecosystem is nowhere as cohesive because we're all disagreeable people. So when we come to Haskell, we have Fay, PureScript, Haste, GHCJS, Idris, if you are particularly ambitious in how you're going to do JavaScript. Um, and these are all great at replacing JavaScript. Um, GHCJS is probably the most interesting one because obviously it's built into the main compiler. So it's our closest we have to closure script. But in terms of like most usable, it's probably pure script. Um, if you have ever run into Bodil stock, she does a fantastic talk on pure script. Um, but my problem with all of these is as a front end developer, well, as a full stack developer, these are all great at replacing JavaScript. But unfortunately, it's not the whole picture when you're doing this stuff. Um, because HTML and CSS are also imperfect. Um, I mean, the main problem with JavaScript is, as a language, it has horrible semantics. The main problem with HTML and CSS is you have no idea what they're going to do, to the point that someone has gamified this. Um, this is a challenge called Code in the Dark. Basically, the uh, participants come all in one place. They get given a code editor with no syntax highlighting and no browser previewing, and they're told to replicate a web page. Um, this is hilarious because they all have a go, and they're all professional front-end coders, and without being able to see what it is they're doing as they go, when they show the results 20 minutes later, it's all complete nonsense. Like, HTML and CSS are bad to the extent that they are humorous for people participating in it. So then come to Elm again. So Elm brings all this together. It's a language which compiles to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's all nicely typed. Um, and in general, it's the complete package and was built to treat these three elements together as a GUI system, um, which solves most of the problems that I experience when doing full stack dev, um, especially when doing front end. So we're going to dive straight in. Um, as I said, this was written an hour ago, so it may run short. It may make no sense. Please feel free to interrupt me, and we'll talk about it a bit more. Um, but yeah, so straight away, I think the best way to kind of show how simple 
uh, Elm is for doing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, just look at text. So if we go to the typical Hello World example, um, this is literally just rendering plain text. Uh, we've got a type signature there, but I'll explain more about what that means shortly. Um, so has anyone here not seen Haskell or familiar with how Haskell looks or anything like that? Okay, just one. Okay, that's a good start. Um, so I'll briefly explain some things. Um, so obviously in the top, those are our module imports. Um, after the module names, we just have two dots in brackets. That just means we're importing the whole module because I'm incredibly lazy and stupid rather than importing just things I'm using. Um, and then this top first line is the interesting one. That's the type signature. So we're saying that main has the type of element in this case. Um, element is just an abstraction in Elm that represents all of the HTML elements, divs, paragraph tags, that sort of thing. Um, any of you who do Haskell or Idris will know there's some contention over whether a type signature should be a single colon or a double colon. Elm goes with single. Does not judge them. Um, so we get straight into the meat then. So we've got plain text, which is hello world. So this is literally just rendering Hello world as plain HTML text. So straight away, if we were doing this in H HTML, it'd probably already be longer because we'd have to have our H HTML opening tag, then our div, and all that sort of nonsense. Um, but there's no styling in here, so it's relatively simple. Um, and this is nice. This is quite good. We could do a lot of text like this, but a lot of people, like when you're doing large pages of text, or you're doing like web is a document format after all. When you're doing large pages of text, you don't especially want to have to do lots and lots of plain text and map it all together to get your structure. Um, this is where Elm straight away has some advantages and that gives us Markdown. Uh, so we actually, it actually has a Markdown uh, module in the core library and we can just embed that straight into a document and it handles all the HTML styling and everything for us. Um, and when this compiles, um, it just deals with it really. Um, and it has the full Markdown features. You can do links, um, whether inline or underneath. Um, also don't forget to do the feedback. Um, so straight away, it's very nice for the basics of the web, which is documents. Being, it's meant to be, Elm is built for GUIs and games, but already it's somewhat superior to HTML, CSS, and CSS, uh, JavaScript. So as I said, we had that element type, which is the abstraction over HTML, HTML elements. Um, one of the core things that Evan, the creator of this, one of the things he struggled, one of the inspirations for Elm, was how hard it is to actually uh, create sensible layouts in uh, HTML and CSS. The web is a text, is a document format. CSS is built for layouts, but there's still, even like 20 years later, no easy way to do things like vertical centering. That's just complete madness. Um, so Evan was very keen on creating this concept of like being able to stack elements and flow in the page. So one of the things uh, that we have is this flow function. And we can just put a load of elements together and then decide which way they flow. So this is just a list of elements. Anyone who hasn't seen the list abstraction before, the square brackets are just a list. Um, and then we're just giving them the flow and a direction. We can change that direction to up, left, right, inwards, outwards, and the whole page will just render sensibly. So if we go and have a look at this, oh, which way have I put it? That one, oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, we can have a look at this. So this, that's not on the right page. <laughs> uh, So, can everyone see that? Okay, great. So this is the. Yeah. Sure you don't speak too fast. Oh, sorry, I have that problem a lot. Um, if I do speak too fast, if you just stick a thumb up, I'll try and slow down. This is slow for me, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I recommend never looking me up on YouTube. You will not be able to understand a word. Anyway, so. Um, and this is actually the Elm Online Editor. I'll cover the tools a bit later, but as I said when we did the buzzword roundup, a lot of what is really special about Elm is the environment and the tools. So if you've been keeping an eye on Swift, you've seen it's got the Swift Playground, all those sort of things. Evan actually kind of built these tools uh, for Elm somewhat before Swift was announced, inspired by the work of people like um, Brent, who used to work at Apple before Swift, etc. Um, so we've got this hot swapping editor, and we've got the view of what comes out of it. So we can have this auto-update. So for example, if I introduce a massive gargle of rubbish at the top, it should hopefully auto-update and give us a nice error. Um, lovely pass error there, which is nice. And it also, oh, my backspace key worked. One sec. Oh, my backspace is working. OK. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so we've got this flow function. And we can change the direction of that. So if we were to replace that with up, 
we'll then see, hopefully, that the list will reverse. Okay. So the elements we've given it, the direction of flow just reversed. Um, and then obviously that's going to be the same for left and right. We can just have that go outwards. Um, and then you can layer them as well um, with the outwards and inwards function. Um, though in text, this tends to produce oh, an error. Interesting. I think that just needs to be outward. Welcome to the last hour of my life. Um, yeah, though in text, this tends to produce some horrible results. Um, but in images, it works a bit better. So if we go. But then, obviously, we don't just want element. Oh, yeah, with these, you can also do the typical box layout. So the box model of the web can also be very easily modeled with this. You can have boxes which have backgrounds, and you can stack them in nice ways and create flows across your page, which, if you're doing forms, is especially nice. Um, like, having a lot of text input is lovely with this method. Um, but obviously, we also want complex shapes as well, especially Elm is used for a lot of games. And especially now with CSS and Canvas and uh, the new animation features, this is one of the like, best use cases for Elm. Um, it's very good for, I mean, almost all of their examples on the site are like, there's a Mario game and a Pong game and a Zelda game, etc. Um, so it has a quite a nice inf interface to Canvas. So this would be quite, a, well, not tricky, this is relatively easy to do in Canvas. It's just a lot longer than you'd want for two shapes, whereas in Oh, actually, I think I put the code in there. Whereas in Elm, no, nope, I didn't put the code in there, because no, I did. <laughs> in Elm, it's uh, three lines, excluding the type signature. Um, so what we have here is the concept of forms and collages. So when you're dealing with just with text and boxes, you're dealing with elements. When we come to these, we're dealing with forms. So forms are basically canvas elements. So we can specify, uh, if we look right at the end here, we've got this n-gon thing. Um, that is obviously a polygon of n dimensions, well, n sides. and uh, radius. Um, and then we've just specified some colors. This is all just done through composition and application. It's really nice and lovely. And then move, which is just where we're putting it in the document. And then we've just collaged both those shapes together in a canvas of a certain size. Um, absolutely beautiful, really easy to do. Um, and again, if we were to open this up in the editor, if I've got it open, I'm not that, no, not that clever, um, we can mess around with that very easily. So we kind of get on to, actually, I'll talk about flow quickly. So I mentioned earlier that the flow stuff is a lot nicer when we're dealing with images. Um, so obviously, here we have some images that are just being flowed. Again, I could reverse this um, just to reverse the images. But you can also layer things really well. So we've got these three things here. We can create not quite a nice composition of the C cells and the text. Um, and doing anything like that is absolute hell on earth in HTML and CSS. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can inspect. So, if we, which which one do you want to see? Uh, anyone. Just okay. I guess I don't know whether it's going to be. You know. So we just do inspect. Yeah. So it's actually compiling it and putting the compiled HTML obviously right there. Yeah. Um, so if we were to look at this layering, for example, um, I mean, yeah, it doesn't produce the cleanest HTML, but it's not awful. Certainly a lot better than what Dreamweaver does. Um, so. Yeah, it's just literally just doing the divs and the right styles and padding. It's doing it all in line, obviously. Um, but it's not atrocious. Um, uh, yeah. Which side? Yeah. Oh, shadow root. What that bit? Uh, yeah, so it can do that. Um, I don't cover it in this talk, but it can do. Um, it also does WebGL, which is quite cool. Okay. Um, in fact, there's a WebGL. If you're interested in that, there's a WebGL example just at the oh, somewhere. Oh, WebGL. There we go. Um, so we can have a look at that at the end. I'm probably going to underrun on time, so we'll go and have a look. Cool. So, um, but then obviously, as I said, it's very useful for GUIs and for games. And the thing that mainly powers that is the functional reactive concept. So this is when we get to signals. So most of Elm is built around this concept of signals. And quite simply, they're just values that change over time. You just have this signal type that is a that built into language is something that can update. So I mean, the simplest example is for mouse position. So mouse.position is a signal that just updates every time the mouse is moved. Um, we're then mapping everything coming out of that signal, obviously, there's quite a lot with the as text function just to output it. So 
if we were to go and look at this on the site, again, I don't know if actually it's one open, I think I've got a similar one open. Okay, I've got a similar one open. Um, but as we can see, this is reacting. This is quite a complex one using the collages. Um, this is reacting very smoothly and very nicely because it's just constantly sending updates to Elm, which is listening for the change in signals. Um, and functional reactive is something that's getting a lot of popularity. I mean, there's like loads of li uh, libraries for JavaScript and all sorts of things now. Um, but the problem with libraries and with like there's a lot of languages that aren't built for it, the abstraction tends to be very clunky. I mean, this admittedly, the FRP in Elm isn't as good as it could be. It's uh, FRP purists, like people who are using um, the FRP, like, like Yampa for Haskell, for example, find uh, Elm's FRP infuriating. Um, but I think it's very simple and very easy to use. Um, and one of the things that I really like with it, especially having tried to manage state in Haskell, which, I mean, it's something you obviously try to avoid, um, is how easy it is for signals to state. Um, I don't think I've got the mouse click over. Oh, I do, yeah. So, oh, there's mouse position. So, yeah, as you can see, just super easy. And then we've got this fold p function, which is fold from the past. So it folds across past signal values. Um, and we've just got a simple count here. It's just very, very, very easy to model state. And because they are this simple representation of signals, unlike Yampa, unlike the um, other implementations that are available for functional languages, you don't have to worry too much about the implementation. Um, there is a lot of advice on using signals in the Elm documentation. The main bit of advice they give is like, define your signals at the beginning, your inputs you're going to use, and then stay the hell away from them. Because um, you don't want too many, same reason we do everything else, like you want to avoid too many side effects going on, you avoid too much input. Um, just standard advice, like if you've got a list of signals, can you change that to a signal of lists, that sort of thing. Um, and then this again is a very nice uh, part of the language, which I, is one of the things I prefer over Haskell. So obviously Haskell has records, um, but the records in Elm are slightly more flexible in what they could do. They're closer to, you could think of them more as JavaScript objects with some of the safety guarantees of Haskell records. So obviously all data structures in Elm are immutable. Um, so if we just define a basic record, we can just give it fields, just in similar Haskell syntax. Um, and we can set values to those fields. Um, we can access them with dot syntax. Um, obviously the top one will be familiar to anyone doing imperative programming. And the bottom one, when you put a dot in front of a field, you actually make an accessor function, which you can then give a record and it will access it. So the interesting thing about this is unlike JavaScript objects, if you try to access a field that doesn't exist in a record, it will throw an error at compile time, which JavaScript doesn't do, um, which is nice. And we can also pattern match on fields. So this sum function, for example, will take any object, will take any uh, record that has X and Y. It doesn't matter what that record is, what the type of that record is. It doesn't matter if it has extra fields. It doesn't matter if it if what the values those fields are, what the type of those fields are. Well, it does in this case, we're using plus. Um, but this is where we start to get structural typing. Because we can pattern match or do things only over some fields, we can kind of do like very similar to the prototypical inheritance in JavaScript. So you don't necessarily have to bin your existing JavaScript abstractions, because they will work in Elm as well due to this. Um, and this is also, this is where the object model falls apart, because uh, Java doesn't really do this properly. Um, and then obviously we can update. This syntax confused me for ages because it looks like list comprehensions, um, but you get used to it pretty quickly. So that's just updating the Y field. Um, you can remove fields with this admittedly infuriating minus syntax because then the syntax to add a field in is that. So they've got these syntax for doing things and they break it for removing fields. Um, but whatever. Um, so yeah, that's just adding the field Z. So we can add any field we want to any record. Um, but then that was kind of ad hoc records. That was just a function with an object thrown straight in it. Really what we want is closer to Haskell's records where we do them as a uh, data type. Um, so we can just type the records we've done, or we can do them as a type alias. So again, here we have the coordinate. Um, and we're defining that we want two fields of type float. Um, again, these can be extensible. So if we give the, give the type alias a parameter, that parameter uh, can be a new field. So when we work on functions with it, we can pass in a new field and just add it to our record. So those are kind of the basic building blocks of Elm and all the things that, well, like 
the essential components of what it can do. Um, so, as I said, it's very easy to get started with this, so let's look at some tools. Um, so if, you, if any of you have got laptops open, you can literally jump straight into this now. If you go to elmlang.org forward slash try, you get into that editor that I showed you earlier, the hot swapping editor. So let's have a quick look over some of the more complex examples. So one of the good ones, if I've got it, oh, I haven't got it open the right one. So I go to the Mario one. I love this one. Cool. Let's add that. So this is just a very simple platformer. Where's Mario? There he is. <laughs> so Mario's just jumping along. And obviously, because it's hot swapping, we can change if you want. So if we look at the gravity function, for example, uh, which is here, for some reason the line indentation has been messed up. Um, but I can manipulate gravity just by changing that to say for example 20 and that should auto up I've got auto update enabled that should auto update oh, it hasn't and then Mario should now be able to jump incredibly high <laughs> which is fairly nice and this will ease your development flow a lot so does it need to reset the state of the known starting point it does in this one but I'll show you a different tool in a second that doesn't um, so this does reset the state when you change the code. Um, there's certain, I don't know, it's a bit unpredictable. There's certain times when it doesn't. They actually recently broke this in one, so it's, Elm's just come to version 0 0.14 and they managed to break all the online tools so that it's now quite unpredictable. Um, but there's a version of this tool, which we'll cover in a minute, um, called Reactor, which is the one you get when you download and install the ecosystem, um, which is a bit more reliable. Um, yeah, so one of the main things I want to highlight about this code is uh, this is the entire Mario game here. So that's loading all the images, it's doing the movement, it's doing all the user input, and that's doesn't have line counts in this, few in this editor, but that's really, really, oh, okay, boom. Less than 50 characters, uh, 50 characters, that'd be incredible, 50 lines. Um, and you can see how they've, so one of the concerns from people who have looked at Elm um, and seen that like it's got this combination of all three of the front end languages is like, oh, what about separation of concerns? You were just mashing all these things together. Um, they have documentation concerning this on how you should architecture your, uh, how you should structure your um, Elm programs. And basically they break it down by model, update, and view, um, which they do here, except they've named the view stage Mario for some reason. Um, I don't know, display, that's probably it. Um, so the basic advice for writing on programs is always start, it's the same when you do any program really, um, is to start with your models. So that's where you want to define your records, what updates, your signals, your inputs. Um, then create your update functions, like each frame, what is it that changes? Um, and then just render that and display it. Um, and if you follow these patterns quite strictly and you do use the module system and break components out, it doesn't get too much of a mess. So um, as we said earlier, there is a, another tool um, that doesn't reset the state every time, and that is the debugger. So I now can't see Mario. It's been there we go. So this is the time traveling debugger, so called. Um, and again, this is the same thing. We can change the code and recompile it. But the really cool thing about this is I don't know if that's actually visible. So when oh, that's a pain. So that's not drawing the path for some reason. There we go. So can you see that grey path there? That is basically uh, the, because of the signals and the fact that their value is changing over time, it's keeping all of the previous states of the game. Um, so we can rewind the execution path and see what's going on different, and get all of the state at different points. Now the really cool thing is, say for example now, so we're 139 actions into the game, if I were to go back and change the gravity, which I can't because reasons. Okay. <laughs> As I said, it's a bit broken right now. Apparently it has no mouse interaction. <laughs> if I were to add 34 there, we can see that it's updated it and it's gone back through the previous states and applied the new code to all of those states. Um, so we can now rewind this through and see where Mario would be with all of our changed states. So there was a video a while ago before Elm was made, one of the things that actually inspired this, ed uh, this debugger. Um, 
I can't remember who the guy's name was, but basically he conceptualized a uh, game IDE very similar to this where he was designing a Mario level and wanted to make a jump particularly tricky and he wanted you only be able to get for that jump in certain conditions and he went back and changed all the states until the conditions would, until he had designed that level. There's a variety of ways in which this helps, um, but I, I, I'm just infinitely amused by how by changing values around and experimenting with things. And it also makes learning the language very easy because you can pick up other people's examples, throw them straight in, and just change things and see instantly what is affected. So I said there's an offline version as well. This is called Reactor. So this is uh, just a local host. Um, you just start it from a terminal. And it goes to your uh, base folder and finds all the Elm files in your directory. And then you can enter the time traveling debugger with them, or you can just view them straight up. Um, so this allows you to use pretty much any editor you want. Like I use Sublime, so I have Sublime, half the screen, this and the other half. And I just either stay on the time traveling debugger um, or I refresh the page every now and then. Obviously, you don't get the hot swapping with this. Um, but there is, uh, if you want the hot swapping editor, you can't, the elmlang.org is actually written entirely in Elm. So all of the tools are written in Elm. That's like the updating is enabled by signals. So you can just go down to GitHub, download them, build them, and run them locally as well. Um, which is a very nice feature of the language that the online tools are also written in Elm and compilable. So I think that's pretty much all the content I wanted to talk about. So let me look. Ah, yeah, okay. So yeah, that is pretty much all the content I want to talk about. Does anyone have any questions at this stage? No, all good? Cool, okay. So I think the last thing I want to finish on um, is, as I said, um, I work for PayPal. Uh, we run a series of hackathons um, called BattleHack. We don't get anything from these. We run these because we like hackathons and we were like, how do we throw the best hackathon we can? Wait a minute, we work for a company with lots of money. So that's what we did. Um, I'm always very frustrated sitting in these hackathons when I see Ruby and PHP people winning them all the time. I had one person attempt one in Haskell last year in Berlin and they gave up halfway through and changed to Ruby. So if, you, if you've done any like programming under pressure conditions before, it's 24 hours. Um, if you win, you get flown to San Francisco to compete for 100,000 um, pounds. If you've done anything like that, or you enjoy those sorts of things, please come to the Italy one. We're coming to Venice in July 11th and 12th um, and write something in FP and win so people stop laughing at me and my team for being Haskell. That'd be amazing. Um, if you have any questions about that or anything I've spoken about, um, you can tweet me or just come speak to me. I'll be around all day. Uh, thank you, everyone. Sorry, that's a bit of a mess. Um, as far as I understand it, it's incredibly closely integrated because the editors rely a lot on uh, being able to hook into the signals that you're actually getting from your running program. Um, so it's not only built on Elm, it's actually during compile time getting all of the signals there, for example. I mean, theoretically, as long as you were doing something with an FRP library where you could get at the state, well, actually, as long as you can get the state at every second throughout the well, every microsecond throughout the game, uh, throughout what you were doing, you could probably do it. Um, but then there are alternatives to other language, like if, uh, Lighttable has some of these features in it. I mean, I know Lighttable's now been abandoned, um, but if you're a JavaScript programmer, Lighttable's pretty stable. Um, it has some plugins for other languages. They're not great, but Lighttable has some of these features. It definitely has hot swapping, and for some languages, it has the debugging. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, as long as you had some way of getting at the state for all paths of the execution, then yes. But um, I don't know, it'd be a big rewrite. You'd probably be better off just trying to write a new one from scratch in GHCJS, to be honest. But yeah. I mean, it's worth having a guess. It's all, all online, so you can have a look. <laughs> it's, I think I saw someone else's hand up there. Was, oh, yeah. Um, so the question there, if anyone didn't hear, was uh, how hard is it to exist with existing JavaScript libraries? Um, so the answer to that, as I'm, let me just call a look, um, is very, oh, I love how that key sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, it's very easy. There's actually on here, where is it? So it has a uh, JavaScript FFI 
um, which is uh, something which is common to all of the um, Haskell to JavaScript compilers. They all tend to have a very good foreign function interface. Um, so the one in Elm. So it's all based on ports. It's basically, um, it's not the most complete one. Um, you create a port which basically sends signals through and then you can hook into that from JavaScript and vice versa. Um, if you're really keen on being able to fully utilize your existing JavaScript ecosystem, I'd probably recommend something closer to Fay. So with Fay, that's more like a typed jacket around JavaScript. Um, so basically all you do with Fay is just add type signatures to existing JavaScript and then wrap those JavaScript in foreign function interface calls. Um, I don't know, there's, there's actually a graph somewhere online from another talk that shows kind of all of these languages on a graph going from GHC compatible to JavaScript compatible. Elm is very browser friendly, but not terribly JavaScript friendly. I mean, it is doable, but it's not the nicest thing to do in the world. I don't know if that answers the question. I kind of dance around it. No, basically, it's horrible. <laughs> you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, as I said, I'm around all day if you have any questions. I highly recommend just diving in and playing with it. You can load up any of these examples and just edit them straight away. Um, and just change things, and they just work. Oh, not like that though. Um, so yeah, thanks. <laughs>